put this to the cloud. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Nicole Holubar Walker, and I am the Director of Learning and Development at the Emory Alumni Association. We're so glad to have you all here, either live with us. Uh, on the 23rd or watching um, afterwards via our recording. Um, so I'm excited to go ahead and kick off today's program, which is a session called Emory Explores, uh, one year post row. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two Emory alumni physicians joining us today who will speak to today's topic um, and to introduce everyone. Um, we have Rachel Neal, uh, who is a graduating uh, Complex Family Planning Fellow. Uh, before I turn it over to Rachel, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, as this is a Zoom webinar, uh, everyone is automatically muted and your screens cannot be seen. However, if you do have a question for our speakers, you're welcome to drop them into the Q&A box uh, that you can view in your Zoom toolbar. Um, and we will get to those questions at the end of today's session. Um, and if you prefer to send anything directly to me via chat, if you're having any issues, any technical difficulties, uh, feel free to drop those into the chat um, and feel free to send them directly to me. So without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to Rachel Neal. Hello, everybody. Um, I am honored to be able to introduce to you our two speakers today. Um, first, we have Dr. Adam Jacobs, who is a board-certified OBGYN, who serves as the medical director of the Division of Complex Family Planning in the Raquel and Jamie Galinsky Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, and he is the Ryan Residency Family Planning Program Director for the Mount Sinai Hospital. He has established multiple family planning programs over his career, including development of formal family planning and clinical training at the Mount Sinai Hospital in 2004 and a LARC training program at the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. He has received commendation for these efforts as a medical educator and has won multiple awards, including the CREOG National Faculty Excellence Award um, for Resident Education and the APGO Excellence in Teaching Award. Um, he actively served as the board member for several leading family planning service and advocacy organizations, including Planned Parenthood of New York City and Physicians for Reproductive Health. Um, his research interests include abortion safety, understanding and reducing abortion stigma, and contraception for transgender individuals and adolescents, and has published this research in a number of peer-reviewed journals and presented this work at national conferences. And presenting with him is my program director, Dr. Carrie Swiak. She completed her medical degree at St. Louis University and residency training in OBGYN at the University of Connecticut, and she completed her fellowship in family planning and master's in public health and epidemiology here at Emory. She's been providing patient care for the Grady Health System since 2001 and is directly appointed as professor of epidemiology in Emory's Rollins School of Public Health and a professor of GYNOB at the Emory School of Medicine. Um, she specializes in contraception and reproductive health care, especially for high-risk patients, and has completed multiple studies and published in that area. She teaches healthcare providers, fellows, residents, and students, and has received multiple honors um, and awards for her work in the field, including the Excellence in Teaching Award for Family Planning for multiple years, the APGO Excellence in Teaching Award, and the Alumni Award for Medical Students for Choice. As the Family Planning Division Director, she strives to maintain a diverse um, division research program that enables us to engage in varied aspects of behavioral and clinical research, both domestic and abroad. And with that, I'll turn it over to our two speakers. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And um, let me get started here and actually, um, Nicole will be uh, controlling the slide, so you'll hear me saying next, uh, everything. So uh, we can move forward. Next slide. Okay, I have no disclosures. And just some of the objectives for this morning, or this actually for this afternoon's talk, background in abortion information, history of abortion laws, um, where we are in the post-Roe landscape now at one year, and next steps and how you can help. Uh, next slide. So some basic abortion facts, uh, about 25% of women will have an abortion by the age of 45. 
and you can see the breakdown that occurs by age underneath that. About 51% of women who become pregnant and have an unintended pregnancy are using contraception at that time. And approximately 66% of abortions occur under eight weeks of gestation and 88% under or before 12 weeks. Next slide. Okay, um, abortion stats and policies do matters. Um, over years, just to give a little bit of background, uh, the peak of abortions in the United States were in the 1980s, which about at the range uh, rate of about 1.6 million per year. Those have dramatically dropped um, over the decades down to um, its lowest point of 862,000 um, in 2017. And a lot of that was based, again, on some policies like access to highly effective contraception, like IUDs and Nexplanon, adolescent contraception, patient education, health literacy, and better understanding of health equity and disparity. So again, improving access to those contraceptions dramatically uh, decreased the unintended pregnancy rate and the abortion rate over those 30 years. Next slide. In the most recent update that came out in 2020, the numbers did climb slightly. And again, policies do matter when it comes to abortion. Some states did expand their Medicaid coverage, which may have improved, improved access to abortion for patients. There were certain things like the gag rule and Title 10 defunding, which might have actually decreased access to contraception in those Title 10 clinics um, by aspect of not being able to talk about contraception. And if they did, they were no longer funded. And that may have increased unintended pregnancies. And again, there's been an outreach over the last few years to have increased funds set up. So again, you are seeing a slight increase and those policies again do ultimately matter. Next slide. Um, again, I'm not going to read all of here that's on here, but some abortion indications, unintended pregnancies, everything from maternal indications, anomalies, and again, fetal indications. Next slide. And then again, there's many reasons why a, you know, a patient may ultimately decide uh, to have an abortion. Anywhere from financial reasons, fetal health reasons, partner-related reasons. There are multiple reasons that are listed here. But again, there are so many personal decisions that are being made here by a patient that may lead them to choose to have an abortion. Next slide. Okay, so before I get to a little bit more of the post-row landscape, it's important to sort of understand uh, where we've been um, or what's been going on over the last 30 to 40 years. So how did we ultimately get here in this situation? So let me go to the next slide. So just to give a little bit of legal background here, Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973 and it gave abortion a federally protected right. The next big legal um, step was Casey, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. What that did was is it upheld Roe, which was very important, but it opened up this sort of sort of issue here of where it overturned strict scrutiny, and I'm going to describe that, and then undue burden became an issue too. So strict scrutiny is where there is a standard to nevertheless hold the law constitutional, but it gives the state government, if it feels that there is a compelling interest, like patient safety, that it may allow the state to override that constitutional right or put some sort of limits on the constitutional right. Um, the undue burden is to, pr to protect the constitutional right or, or to protect Roe and balance out a state's sort of compelling interest for protection and again versus overriding the constitutional or federal constitutional you know, um, legality. And again, there's been a balance over 30 years that went on on this of strict scrutiny versus undue burden. Next slide. And again, strict scrutiny can be very vague the legal bar can be set very low just by saying something is safe. And again, you get into a situation where lots of organizations can't ultimately challenge all these. It becomes politically too hard, too much money, time, and fight. And again, you get into this battle of what the state deems is safe versus is it too much and it overreaches and becomes undue burden. Next slide. So what this led here for a practically 30 years was this testing of this undue burden and strict scrutiny. And what it led to was is where a state could then impose waiting periods. These were now things that were being imposed on patients to make access to abortion more difficult. Waiting periods, male partner consent, parental consent, gestational age cutoffs, even things like a forced pelvic exam, which was only something that occurred five to six years ago in Missouri, that an exam beforehand was necessary when it clearly was not actually even paying for the cost of the remains of an abortion in Pennsylvania. So again, all of these things were being passed in states 
by saying that, oh, this is so important, and it never crossed the threshold of what was being considered undue burden, even though many people felt it was, but ultimately, these ultimately sort of, I want to say, won out in the sort of balance between the two of them, or just never got challenged because just it wasn't from the standpoint of those organizations worth challenging or it would not be sort of upheld in the state. Next slide. Um, and then after that sort of balance of undue burden versus strict scrutiny, the next fade was to move away from um, sort of moving towards patients and burdens on patients and actually moving towards burdens on basically facilities and doctors. And then these were called trap laws. And what these did were ultimately um, basically, if a doctor practiced in the state of Mississippi, they could prevent them from providing abortions if they could not get hospital privileges in the state of Mississippi, which again, became very easy because then just the state of Mississippi limited it and they could no longer practice. And then also other things like basically ambulatory facility regulations, just by limiting the facility height, you could go into the, the abortion practice and if the ceiling height was 12 feet or the hallways were 10 feet, just say, well, they need to be 10, two feet you know, wider or higher and that could shut down the practice. So after the first so-called attack on patients and sort of making barriers, then the next phase was actually these trap laws. Next slide. And then what you saw recently, which was in 2021, which was sort of the blueprint that was gonna ultimately happen if Roe was not overturned, was actually taking it out of the constitutional amendment, okay? And basically what uh, Texas did was the SBA T Texas fetal heart ban. And what they did was they set up a $10,000 civil bounty. Any doctor, any person that drove a patient to a clinic, anybody that assisted in a woman getting an abortion before six weeks, could be challenged, you know, sued for a ten thousand dollar bounty, and what that did was is the this really was a surprise to a lot of people because everybody felt that this clearly would have actually reached the undue burden threshold, but ultimately what ended up happening was is the Supreme Court ultimately decided to not take this case as undue burden by saying it was not in the federal constitutional issue. This was a civil amendment, so this was really actually a setup plan by the attorney, you know, the legal system to ultimately set this up. And you had this put in place to basically now move forward on that. So you've had this sort of significant attack going on for 30 years, all the way up to the point of a civil attack. And then next slide. And then what you had here was June 2022. Basically, at this point was Roe was overturned. It removed the federal protection. Casey was removed, so there's no longer any issue of strict scrutiny or undue burden was gone, and it now pushed it all back to the states to, for the states to ultimately make the decision. And in a lot of people's minds, everybody thought that this was the final domino to fall, and that ultimately this was it, and that this is what, you know, again, would be the end point. And really for, again, a lot of people that have been involved in this for years, Really, this wasn't the end point. This was really, again, another sort of in this 30 year phase of steps. This is just not another phase in it. And we're now actually seeing the post row phase. And next slide. And in the post row rate, in the post row phase, what you're seeing is right now is it really wasn't an attempt to actually get it to the states. You're seeing the Mifepristone ban that basically went up the, the Texas legislature to basically you know, limit the control of the FDA to take mifepristone off the market for the entire country. You're seeing something that's really frightening here, the Idaho abortion trafficking law that passed, the idea that you know if a patient wanted to travel from one state to another state to basically have an abortion is protected within the constitution. So what o Idaho did was, is they said, fine, you can cross the state, that's legal, but the distance of traveling to the border within the state of Idaho, you will be sued for that. So ultimately you could cross the state, but traveling from the center of the state of Idaho to the border, that's a crime. Um, legal attacks on providers. There was one big case of a provider in Indiana who was taking care of a patient who traveled from Ohio and even attempts from governors to basically ask other governors to extradite patients, which has actually been, I mean, the governor of Oregon sort of told the governor of um, Utah or Idaho that was not reasonable. And so did the governor of Michigan saying, we are not extraditing patients that travel from one state to another. So again, Roe was not the end. Roe was just one of the phases to basically, 
And again, you've seen other, you know, governors, I'm sorry, senators like Lindsey Graham actually sort of actually propose a full federal 15 week ban. So Roe is not the end. Roe is just one of the phases in this. Next slide. So where are we now? Next slide. So this is a really good slide here that I think is really represents where we are. And this is produced from the Guttmacher Institute. And Nicole, I might have a little bit of help here with your pointer here, if you can. Um, what you see here is the maroon colored states are the ones that are the most restrictive. And these are the states that have full on abortion bans. Some of them may have certain, you know, um, issues for allowing for maternal health and for, uh, you know, fetal viability. Some of them actually don't even have any sort of, you know, um, ability to get an abortion even for rape or incest. But these are the states that basically have full on abortion bans. What you're seeing here is in the states that are orange, um, which includes Georgia and Carrie is gonna talk a little, Dr. Swiak will talk more about this later, has a ban at six weeks. Um, Arizona is about at 15 weeks at this point. Um, and then what you're seeing here is if you wanna stay sort of where you are in Georgia here, just in the last 12 weeks here, I'm sorry, in the last three weeks, you're seeing basically Georgia, I'm sorry, Florida, obviously south of Georgia has gone to six weeks. So they basically would be now in the orange. Uh, North Carolina has now gone to 12 weeks. They would be orange. And South Carolina is heading towards six weeks. So you are seeing now, I mean, more and more states that are becoming even more restrictive, either with full bans or this whole area significantly in the Southeast. And again, very much around uh, Georgia at this point that has either full bans or really significant bans. The states that you see here in blue are the states that are the most protective and again, are seeing a significant increase in numbers of patients coming to those states, okay? Um, and this is a great slide. This gets updated every few months. And again, it's a little bit scary when you actually see this in a full map. Next slide. Okay, what does that sort of map actually represent? There are about 17 states that have actually no access to abortion services, about 13 of them with a total ban. Uh, two states now with ultimately six-week bans, Georgia and Florida. Wisconsin is in a legislative shutdown, and Arizona is basically at 15 weeks. And I can add to this slide um, now, um, North Carolina at 12 weeks, and South Carolina, it's within the legislation. In those states with total bans, and these numbers can be updated, there's greater than 22 million women of reproductive age that are impacted. That is now probably greater now that Florida has dropped from 15 to six weeks, and North Carolina is 12. And again, if you look at in those states, these numbers probably, these accounted for women about 125,000 abortions in 2020. So now in 2022, those women or those cases or procedures clearly can occur in those states. And obviously that number again is increased even more dramatically with Florida and North Carolina going, you know, even to lower limits and ultimately most likely, you know, South Carolina. And then again, if you basically, Based on information from the Guttmacher uh, Institute, it's really basically, you know, we're looking at that 26 states are really, you know, likely to going to have some sort of abortion ban. Right now we have about 17 and with North Carolina and with South Carolina hitting 19. And Nicole, if you can go back one slide, there's some thought here that ultimately, you know, Iowa, Nebraska, possibly Kansas, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, those would probably be the other states that would get you, and Utah would probably get you to closer to the 26. But we are starting to reach, I mean, in the range of highly restrictive or almost extremely, you know, very restrictive up to about 19 states. Okay, next slide, and then the following slide. And what the Guttmacher Institute showed again is this would increase the basically a significant amount of patients that would need to travel up to 143,000. Um, and again, that number has just gone up dramatically just in the last couple of weeks. And the distance that they would have to travel has increased by 97 miles. And that was from 25 to 122. And again, that's gone up dramatically too. Patients were traveling from Georgia to Florida. That no longer can exist anymore. Patients were traveling up to North Carolina. And again, if you're greater than 12 weeks, that can no longer exist anymore. So these numbers do get worse and worse as they go on um, and will continue to get worse uh, without some real pushback. Uh, next slide. What we have actually seen also um, in addition, is through what was known as a We Count survey from the Society of Family Planning. And what we have seen in the data is that there's about 32,000 lesser abortions in the six month period from 2020 compared to 2022, with an average of about 6,000 abortions per month. What we have noticed is that ultimately 
Um, in states where there are bans in place, there are about 43,000 less abortions per year. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, in that six month period um, compared to 2020. And in states where abortions are uh, permitted, there's been a cumulative increase of about 11,000. So patients are getting, and what we expected, some patients are being able to get to states. They have the funds, they have the means, they have the ability to travel. The issue is, is what's happening to the other 32,000 patients? These are the patients now are ultimately, are they being asked to, I mean, keep their pregnancies? Are they ultimately now trying to have unsafe, you know, abortions? What is happening to these patients? And again, it's getting scary. I mean, from this standpoint, because clearly what this has done is put a huge gap for patients. And again, that gap clearly being patients who are marginalized from the healthcare system. Those who are minorities, those who are younger, those who are clearly, who are in poverty. Um, are really struggling ultimately to find states to get care. Next slide. Okay. And then what they found in the We Count survey is a lot of the travel was ultimately being, again, very much local, not as much coastal, because again, from the slide that we showed of the map, there was very much a lot of blue on the coastlines. Uh, Florida did have the a very big increase. That made sense because it was actually up to 15 weeks and it was surrounded by restrictive states and obviously the state of Georgia above it, which was a six week ban. So there was a travel south. That is likely going to stop dramatically and the Florida numbers are going to drop dramatically. Illinois makes sense. It's surrounded by Wisconsin, Missouri, and also you know other states south of it um, that have bans. North Carolina made sense again that Southeast corridor, but now again, North Carolina has dropped to 12. Colorado makes sense, surrounded by sort of the Northwest and very close to Texas. And again, Michigan very much close to where it is. You are seeing some a, a, a movement of some cases, later gestations going to the coast. Uh, there seems to be more of the ability to get those cases done, providers and access uh, for later cases, more in sort of the New York, New Jersey, and maybe in Oregon, California, sort of areas, but again, a lot of it is local travel, not coastal. Next slide. Um, and then again, what we know after, you know, from based on things that have occurred, um, you know, from when, you know, other countries have lost their access, you know, or, you know, to reproductive rights, what we know is for sure is that abortion rates will initially decrease patients, but will usually return to baseline. Patients, if they need an abortion, are gonna do what they need to do to ultimately, get that procedure. Again, un the unfortunate thing is, will it be unsafe? Unsafe abortions will increase. We know that mortal maternal morbidity and mortality will increase. And again, poor and young women or most marginalized patients will be most impacted. What we don't know over time now is, again, it's very early. We are getting some data in a year. What will be some of the aspects of medical abortion and televisits? We don't ultimately sort of know how that's playing out. Again, with the use of televisits and the use of getting medical abortion or mifepristone or other tablets through other outlets. And then again, what will change over time? Will some of these states fight back? Will we put state legislatures in place that ultimately, will we put governors back in place? And will we now actually hold our senators accountable who nominate Supreme Court justices that ultimately are clearly do not believe or actually in the aspect of the protection of Roe v. Wade, which was in place for 50 years and promised during their, you know, um, when they were being uh, questioned, ultimately promised that that would be a protected right. And then next slide. And then again, what you're seeing here is a significant resistance. We are not just basically standing back here. There is a real pushback. We want to make sure that these patients do get the care. There's fundraising to get women from sanctuary states, numerous organizations, Rigid Alliance, Planned Parenthood, National Abortion Federation, the ACLU, working on making sure that patients know what's available to them and get them to where they need to go. And then again, what you're seeing is, is academic centers like Emory University and Mount Sinai, I mean, also stepping up to the plate. It is so important, I mean, to make sure that we are collaborating together from that standpoint, making sure that, you know, Emory is working on making sure that their patients know where to get the care, where the access, and also making sure that their doctors, their students, their fellows are still getting the training they need. Because again, this is not going to be a static issue. It's a dynamic issue. And as the more and more we can get those people trained in the states that have restrictive bans right now, 
when things open up again and when the legislatures change, we need doctors in those states to be able to provide care. So it is so important to make sure that the education is still there and the training. And then next slide. And then what we have here at Mount Sinai that we opened up here is to work with our partners in states that have bans is we do have a philanthropic fund. We've been raising dollars. Um, hospitals are necessary to be able to provide some of the more high risk abortion services, patients who have significant medical issues um, that need to travel some of the later gestational ages. And again, so we are helping out patients through a philanthropic fund. We are taking care of anywhere from about you know two to three patients per month to get them here from other states where we have a significant perinatal bereavement program that we work with these patients that ultimately have to travel up here. But we are partnering with our with our academic centers and our other complex family planning divisions, um, just to, you know, like Emory and the complex family planning division and with my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Swiak, who I am going to probably pass this on to. So next slide. So thank you, everybody. I probably spoke at a, about 100 miles per minute here. I am sorry if I spoke so fast, but there's a lot going on here and I don't want to take away so much important time from Dr. Swiak to explain what's really going on the ground in Georgia. No, that was terrific, Dr. Jacobs. Thank you. And uh, I just want to take the moment again to thank everybody for being here with us. Um, and thank you, Dr. Neal, for introducing us today and uh, to Nicole for setting this up. You can go to the next slide. I don't have any disclosures specific to this topic, and you can go to the next slide. What I'm going to talk about is specifically what's happening in Georgia with the House Bill 481 and review the impact to healthcare and training, and then talk to you about what we do in the Complex Family Planning Division and Fellowship and what our response is um, to these changes. Next slide. So very important to be looking at what is happening in Georgia uh, uh, in the context of this law. And um, unfortunately, we are the second highest state uh, in terms of our maternal mortality rate. These are the latest um, statistics that are available for Georgia from the Department of Public Health. And you can see the most common causes of death are listed here for pregnancy-related maternal deaths. For one of the first times, we're seeing mental health conditions. And despite that, unfortunately, these laws, um, certainly in our state, and in most of the US um, do not um, provide exceptions for um, uh, mental health. Next slide. And uh, the other piece of uh, the, the mortality rate within Georgia is that it's, it's not equal. There's a great disparity. So you can see if you compare those patients with Medicaid funding to those with not without Medicaid funding, and what you're really looking at here is looking at socioeconomic status. And so you see twice as many um, deaths happening um, in Medicaid, um, in people that use Medicaid insurance. And then when you look at race um, among non-Hispanic Black women, the, the mortality rate is twice as high for that of non-Hispanic white women. So we realize that there's a significant health disparity um, that we need to um, that we need to we need to address here in Georgia. Next slide. So um, when you think about the relative safety of abortion in the United States, a person is 23 times more likely to die due to pregnancy complications than due to abortion. And this is not just things that can happen during the pregnancy, but for instance, um, blood clots that are um, tremendously um, increased in risk in the first 24 hours postpartum. So that also um, impacts um, the mortality rate. And um, if you compare the abortion death rate, it's less than one per 100,000 um, cases of abortion. They postulate that if all abortions in the United States stop, 21% more people would die from pregnancy complications, but also importantly, 33% more non-Hispanic Black people would die. So again, um, these laws have a disparate effect. And there's also negative social outcomes that happen for people who are denied a wanted abortion in terms of physical violence that they experience within their relationship, falling below the federal poverty level and, um, and the children that they already have being impacted and not being able to meet developmental milestones. Next slide. So what is happening currently? As of July, 2022, the Georgia House bill went into effect. This is a Living Inf Infants Fairness and Equality Act. It outlaws abortion after fetal cardiac activity is detected. And there are three exceptions. If a physician determines that a medical emergency exists, 
if they determine that medical futility exists, that's also an exception. And this means a congenital or chromosomal anomaly that is incompatible with life after birth. And then for um, people who are 22 weeks or less, if the pregnancy is a result of rape, of rape or incest and they have filed an official police report, then we also can um, provide abortion for them. Unfortunately, this is a tough one because less than half of people who uh, survive sexual assault uh, do actually file a police report. So, so really still a significant burden. Next slide. In terms of access in Georgia, we weren't able to um, immediately look at the impact. It's going to take some time. But what we did, um, the, uh, our team at the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine um, looked at the past um, stat statistics that were available for Georgia that were collected by the state. And we decided to estimate what the access would be, what the impact of the law would be. And so our estimates suggest that only 12% would meet eligibility for abortion. And that's because the fetal cardiac activity is typically detected by six weeks. And so if you looked at um, only those people under six weeks as those who could get an abortion, it's only 12%, unfortunately. And even more importantly, again, we see the disparity. So fewer would be eligible if they were black versus white, if they were younger than 20 versus older than 40, if they had less, um, less than a high school diploma or having a high school diploma versus some college. And on the next slide, if you go to the next slide, Nicole, you can see um, an infographic that um, really illustrates this um, to show just how many abortions um, are reduced in the state and, and how disproportionate they are among young people and um, people with minority status and less um, educational attainment. Next slide. In terms of ultrasound, um, this is also something that's required before an abortion, and it's actually not standard practice. So if you have someone who is very sure of their last menstrual period, they don't have any concerns for a risk for ectopic symptoms, um, that are concerning to you, you actually can safely provide abortion before uh, without having an ultrasound, and yet it's required um, by our state bill. And so uh, we need to continue to provide them. It's not required that you do a transvaginal ultrasound. So we have that at least that is available for our patients. Um, the law also requires the surgeon to tell the patient of the presence or absence of fetal cardiac activity and to document that. And then um, from the previous laws, patients must be offered the opportunity to view the ultrasound and hear the fetal cardiac activity if it's present and possible to hear. And lots of times that makes sense, right? You're doing a test, you're doing um, an imaging um, procedure. You want to be able to provide that information if somebody wants it. But you know, if it's a sensitive situation and they really don't want to know, um, it's unfortunate that, that the law still tells us what we need to do in terms of communicating with our patients. Next slide. And even more, um, the Women's Right to Know Act was in place before HB 481, and it uh, mandates informed consent via state-mandated script at least 24 hours prior to abortion. And you can understand that, again, there are certain circumstances where, of course, I'm going to provide informed consent and talk about benefits and risks and options. But do I need to talk about other things like state um, uh, state um, assistance that's available for childbirth? that fathers are liable for child support in Georgia. Like I have to say those things, even if someone has already made that decision. And that can be, um, that can be quite difficult to have that conversation with people who don't, uh, who doesn't really fit. Um, also parents of minors need notification in our state at least 24 hours prior to abortion. Luckily they don't require consent, but the notification can also be a barrier for minors. And, uh, but luckily we do also have judicial bypass that we can utilize. And then abortions must be reported to the state, but luckily patient names aren't reported. It's just another um, hurdle that providers need to, need to follow though. Next slide. So in terms of Emory, what are the services we provide? Um, we looked at the law. We looked at the exceptions. Um, we reviewed this with our um, Office of General Counsel. We made sure that we were meeting all the requirements of the law and, uh, and, and, and certainly maximizing the care that we can provide that's uh, legally um, uh, compliant in Georgia. So that means we still provide emergency care. We provide early abortion before detectable cardiac activity. 
pregnancy loss, like a, a miscarriage, a fetal demise without detectable cardiac activity, ectopic pregnancy, and pregnancy of unknown location, which really just means it's so early you don't even see fetal cardiac activity, post-abortion complications, where luckily we don't have mandatory reporting in the state, our diagnostic imaging in terms of ultrasound is the same, non-obstetric care um, or medication for pregnant people, care for non-pregnant people. It doesn't impact options counseling. And so we make sure that we provide um, this important counseling for patients, um, information about abortion, contraception information and provision, emergency contraception, and advanced reproductive technologies. So we really make sure that we maximize what we can provide to patients um, within the legal landscape. Now, I've heard this described before um, by my colleague, um, Katie Watson, as um, being on the edge rather than hugging the wall. So instead of saying, oh, no, we're not going to approach this at all, we say, you know what, we can hang on the edge. We don't have to be down in the cliff where it's not legally acceptable, but we can be on the edge and provide the maximum amount of care that we um, that our patients deserve. Next slide. Now, looking at the history of uh, family planning at Emory, this started in the 60s. Uh, Dr. Robert Hatcher, maybe some of you remember him from your time at Emory, um, uh, trained originally as a pediatrician, but started the Emory Family Planning Program at Grady. Um, and uh, we have a long history of educating students, residents, fellows, advanced practice clinicians, and faculty. Um, we have the seminal textbook, Contraceptive Technology, that still comes out of our program and have been involved in managing contraception, which is a popular handbook for, um, for learners. And we still continue the Contraceptive Technology Conference and all of our research trials in contraception and abortion. Next slide. And our program specifically makes sure that we provide care not only for people with basic needs, but for those with complex medical conditions that may be um, a conundrum for other people to take care of and may have additional barriers. We want to make sure that we provide them with all the uh, safe possibilities for care that they can have. So we do receive referrals from throughout the Southeast region because we provide this complex care. We do this for adolescents and adults. And we have a great team that has a diverse clinical and research interests so that, um, again, our patients can get um, this diverse care and we can teach our learners. Uh, we've had our family planning fellowship since 2001. I was actually the first fellow. Um, our Ryan residency training program has been established since 2003. And we've had our um, active family planning division of faculty since 2005. Next slide. Um, our advocacy is um, best told by one of the recent stories about what happened in the early days of HB 481. It was first introduced in 2020, and we banded together again with our faculty colleagues from School of Public Health, with our learners, and we testified against the bill in the House and Senate committees. We also collaborated on a number of different research projects studying the potential impact of the bill, as you saw one of those projects that was published that I showed you. And our faculty um, also joined reproductive health clinics and reproductive justice organizations in our community as plaintiffs in the lawsuit that was brought against the bill. And that's why luckily it was enjoined until last year. And so we were able to stave that off until 2022. This is Dr. Hale Storks here that you're seeing. Uh, she's actually in John Lewis's office um, back when she was a fellow um, and, um, and doing her advocacy work. Uh, she is currently a member of the um, City of Atlanta Reproductive Justice Commission, and uh, so doing a lot of work with ad advocacy as well as her clinical work and teaching and research. Next slide. We're really proud of everything that our graduates have done over the years. A lot of us have stayed at Emory, but you can see a number of people have gone to um, work at other academic medical centers and working with national organizations like Population Services, which has its headquarters in New York, um, a Population Council that has its headquarters in New York, excuse me, and then Population Services International, Planned Parenthood, and Centers for Disease Control. Next slide. So some of our research, uh, Dr. Gold uh, did first a quantitative study looking at like specifically looking at a survey and looked at the COVID-19 pandemic impact on sexual and reproductive health and found that it did impact people who were searching for contraception, but also impacted what their feelings were about having um, uh, a pregnancy um, during the time of the pandemic. She's currently working on her next project, which is a qualitative study. And qualitative research looks at, um, does interviews of, um, of research subjects to get more of an in-depth 
um, look into um, into their attitudes, their behaviors, their feelings about things. And so um, this next um, paper is an example of Dr. Reeves, one of our other fellow graduates um, who, who talked to anesthesia providers and got their perspectives on abortion provision and found um, a very important finding that the more that the anesthesia provider and the obstetrician communicate, the more likely the anesthesia provider is to um, participate in, uh, in, the, in the anesthesia for, for abortion. And um, most recently, Dr. Verma um, uh, published her qualitative study on perspectives on an early abortion ban in a restrictive U.S. state, showing that, you know, people really aren't black and white. If they, and they're more in the gray state, even if they don't feel like abortion is personally for them, they do support, the majority of people do support um, people's right to have a choice. And the more that they listen to people in their community, friends and family about their abortion experiences, the more their empathy grows for people in this situation. So a very important study and we're proud of her for doing that. Next slide. So specifically in terms of our education, we are continuing all legal avenues of education and involvement for our students, our residents, our fellows. That means our curriculum continues, our electives continue. We continue to work with our um, third year medical students. Every third year medical student has access to family planning through our family planning clinic and also access if they want to participate in abortion care. Um, we are doing simulations. So working on um, teaching surgery through models. Um, and again, legally allowed abortion care that we can do, early pregnancy loss care, because it provides the same, um, it's provided through the same medications and surgeries and research and advocacy, as I mentioned. But of course, our direct patient care by our trainees um, and their involvement is adversely impacted because we can provide less abortion care. We are seeing more complications though from people who don't have access to early abortion. And so they're having, um, unfortunately, they're having more access to that. And we have to um, coordinate out-of-state training for our fellows and potentially for our residents so that they get the abortion training that they need. This past year, Dr. Neal um, went to um, Illinois um, and, uh, and um, our first year fellow uh, went to New Jersey for their out-of-state training. If you um, look at um, the cost for the salary and the travel expenses and the living expenses for, um, for a fellow to do um, a six week um, elective, it costs roughly about $15,000 to provide all of that. So it's a, it's a significant expense to our program, but we will continue to provide that as long as we can. Um, next slide. Um, and so again, in general, when we're looking at research, um, uh, it's already shown that restrictive laws have curtailed the obstetric care our patients can, um, our providers can legally offer, and it does impact their ability and their desire to practice obstetrics in Georgia. Not only that, it similarly impacts the ability and desire of trainees to train in and practice obstetrics in Georgia. And this is not just for people who provide abortion care and not just for OBGYNs, because it impacts anyone who's pregnant and may have a, a medical complication or has a complication with their pregnancy. And so it, it certainly impacts a lot of areas of medicine. And um, in specifically in our research, we're going to continue our abortion research, um, even though we have um, limited recruitment um, because we have less abortion care that we can offer. We are increasing our efforts to, um, uh, to surveil morbidity and mortality that's happening in the state because of this law. Next slide. Um, and so this is just another map to show you um, uh, an example of um, where we have, where you see training programs, OBGYN residency programs. And um, unfortunately, we're seeing that almost half of programs and almost half of current OBGYN residents are impacted um, by these um, by these restrictive laws. And um, I just heard today that on Instagram, uh, JAMA Network um, has um, released their latest um, piece uh, talking about this as well, um, how it impacts um, training um, and decisions by fellows and residents and students as far as where to go um, to train within the U.S. Next slide. This is a, um, a piece that we're especially proud. Uh, two of our Emory graduating medical students um, published this, and um, I wanted to put it up because there are a number of really good quotes. And so, uh, yeah, thank you, Nicole, if you can bring those up. Um, 
uh, that, uh, again, from these medical students, great advocates already, we believe that the Supreme Court's decision, which overturns Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, undermines the health of our future patients and our ability to become competent physicians. Students who participate, who do not participate um, in this care, including education about abortion, will be unable to navigate some of the complex medical and social challenges their patients will encounter. By learning how to have these conversations, um, the students improve on metrics of respect for patient privacy and autonomy, professionalism, and humanism, which are core competencies and certainly core medical ethics. And so you can see that um, that these restrictions on um, their training do impact a lot of areas of care. And as the existing physician shortage in the United States is getting worse, uh, we also have this concern. So currently 50% of counties in Georgia don't have an obstetrician. It's not even an abortion provider. They don't have an obstetrician. And we know that about 50% of trainees will stay in the state that they train in um, to, to continue to provide care. And so if we're impacting the trainees that will come to Georgia because of this restrictive law, obviously we're gonna impact on the number of providers that, that um, we can recruit to provide care within Georgia. Next slide. The response from Emory has been very uh, consistent um, from the beginning. Statements from the university president, dean of the School of Medicine, dean of the School of Public Health, affirming the importance of reproductive health care and abortion care as part of ethical, comprehensive health care, and that they will continue. We will continue our missions of clinical care, education, and research. Um, uh, as part of that, our complex family planning fellow fund is available for you to donate to to um, fund directly fellow research projects and out-of-state rotations for them. That is strictly what this fund is going for. As I mentioned, it costs about $15,000 um, to fund one out-of-state rotation per fellow. And, um, and that's not even thinking about um, the research um, that can be done uh, as well if they have the funding to provide it. Next slide. So now it's time for Q&A. Great. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much to Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Spiak for sharing all that information, <laughs> insight, uh, and statistics. So we have about uh, 10 or so minutes for question and answer from the audience. So you do have the ability to submit questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, you are also welcome to submit them anonymously if you prefer. And we will go ahead and uh, try to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, so again, if you have questions for our speakers, um, go ahead and drop them in the question and answer section. Um, if you have any trouble locating that, please let me know. Um, in addition to that, going to pop this slide up here while we do the question and answer. Um, one moment. So um, if you are interested in finding ways to support the, uh, the Complex Family Planning Fellow Fund at Emory, um, you are welcome to scan the QR code on your screen. Um, but we also will share this out after the, the program as well. So, um, and, and Dr. Uh, Swiak and Adams can talk, or Jacobs can talk a little bit more um, about uh, additional ways for you to be, uh, to be a part of uh, the work that they're doing. Uh, so with that, actually, we have a great question. Um, the first question is, what can an abortion advocate do to help? Harry, do you want to take that to start? Yeah, so I think one of the things to recognize is that there are a number of groups that are doing a great amount of work. Um, Dr. Jacobs mentioned them already. Some of the funds that can directly fund patients who need to um, uh, increase their um, travel in order to get abortion care. Um, so, uh, so donating to to a fund for direct patient care is important. Um, but you know, little things you can do is just talk about abortion. Um, it is healthcare. Um, it is a common part of healthcare um, for people with a uterus. Um, and so um, so ultimately, anyone you talk to probably has, if they haven't experienced an abortion, they may have a family member or a friend that has. And just making it more um, more of something to talk about rather than taboo, I think um, will will open up access in that way as well. Yeah, and, and I agree with uh, Dr. Swiak. Um, there are, you know, there are numerous ways and certainly 
again, I mean, um, it is so important. And I know that, um, you know, from the standpoint that the academic centers are really, you know, stepping up here and making sure that the education and training is so key. Um, if we don't have another generation, I mean, of providers, um, <clears throat> if, you know, we end up getting back state legislatures and governors and those things to turn things around, we need providers to be in those states. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's making sure that dollars go to where patients can get care through funds and philanthropic funds or through bridge and alliance or organizations that can help or Haven Coalition. But really also, I mean, you know, as an Emory alumni, I mean, and somebody who, you know, got an education at Emory, I don't want to see that the fellows or the medical students or the residents don't get the education in this. That is so valuable and so important because it's, you can't lose that. You, you need the next generation. So certainly, obviously, to the academic centers. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the morning after pill and where it sits with the current June 2022 overturn? So when people talk about the morning after pill, it, it actually really refers to emergency contraception, like Plan B or Ella. An emergency contraceptive pill does not um, cause an abortion. It prevents pregnancy. And so it is not impacted by restrictive laws um, that don't impact contraception. Um, that's different than mifepristone, which is an abortion pill. So after there is an established pregnancy, um, it can end that pregnancy. And it's true right now, it's it's a bit in limbo um, since the um, since the judge in Texas uh, attempted to um, overturn the FDA approval. Um, I think that, you know, the we're not out of the woods with that one, unfortunately, but it is still um, available and uh, we're able to use that um, within the legal limits, for instance, in Georgia. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I agree with uh, Dr. Sviak. Again, it went, um, it's still available. Um, and uh, at this point, it went back down to, I believe, the Fifth Circuit of the Texas court. And an opinion came out. It did nothing ultimately changed, um, you know, its curtain situation. Um, and uh, I think that um, probably the prediction is, is that it will probably head back up to the Supreme Court for a decision. Um, and again, um, you know, I don't know when that will ultimately happen, but I, it seems to me that that's where it's heading. But right now, uh, we have all the services that we need with Mifepristone available. Thank you. Um, another question is uh, for those that are uh, planning to get pregnant or currently pregnant, uh, from your perspective, what kind of questions do you think individuals that are planning to be pregnant or are currently pregnant should ask their physicians right now? Well, if they're planning pregnancy, um, then they still need to think about what they would be able to do in the case of a complication. Um, and so I would talk to their, uh, talk to your doctor about, um, what your options are in that, in that case. Um, if there's an emergency so that you know where you can go for safe, um, emergency care, um, and then in some restrictive states, um, if you do have, uh, like, unfortunately, like a fetal anomaly, um, then you may need to consider um, out-of-state travel for, for care. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, as um, one of the pro providers that's right now in a state that has, I mean, full access to abortion services, I mean, a significant, um, the amount, a significant portion of the patients that we're seeing are patients that have ultimately fetal anomalies or ultimately, you know, diagnosed with, you know, fetal abnormalities, genetic abnormalities, and unfortunately are stuck in a situation in a state that has not, you know, where the diagnosis was made either on CVS or chorionic sampling at 12 weeks or on an anatomy scan at 18 weeks. So it is, in, it is important to understand, I mean, that ultimately um, if a pregnancy does, you know, I mean, have an issue with it, where can you go? What's the closest state? And um, ultimately, what would be possibly the cost insurance? I know these are scary. These are really scary questions to think about that you're in a state and that can happen. But it is an important aspect to know what are the laws of your states. And um, if an issue occurred, where could you go? Yeah, and, and it's um, it's important to know that um, 
uh, at Emory, we make sure that we do provide the full um, panel of screening tests that we always have because it's important to have information about what's happening with your pregnancy. It's important to have information for you to make decisions. Um, when I said that, when I talked about the Emory response, you know, it also was really important to them to be sure that that their um, learners and their staff and their faculty who use the Emory healthcare system um, and health insurance had access to care that they needed. Um, and so that was really important to them as well. And I was really proud of them for stepping up about that. Thank you. All right. So if, I don't know if we have any other questions from the audience, um, but if not, I have, I have one final one um, that was submitted ahead of time. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but I will go ahead and ask it. Um, what are the potential implications of the overturn of Roe v. Wade on other constitutional rights, um, like voting rights or uh, marriage equality? Uh, is there anything else that you all are concerned about um, from the decision that this uh, overturn had last year? Well, Adam, I'm gonna let you start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um... I mean, there were certain comments in the Supreme Court um, rulings by, you know, some of the Supreme Court justices, including Clarence Thomas. Um, you know, again, um, if you want to open up, you know, um, that, you know, certainly federally protected things like privacy, which would, you know, possibly include contraception. Yeah, the, the door the door is wide open. Um, you know, I believe it was the, I want to say the Griswold case, I believe in Connecticut, you know, that was the contraception. It unfortunately could open up the door that um, this could bounce back up. There's also some talk about trying to bring back uh, something called the Comstock law, which was this law from 150 years ago that was off the books. I mean, and things like that about contraception going from state to state was considered obscene. There's a lot, but absolutely. I mean, if you open this up to the idea that states get to and what was considered federally protected rights can now go to the states, yes, you have opened the door. And um, a lot of us um, in our field, and I'll give a carry a few minutes to answer it too, is feel that contraception could be the next target. Yeah, and freedom um, of marriage. Um, and, you know, you can see that it has other implications perhaps to other areas of healthcare or other areas where we enjoy privacy within our life. And so, um, you know, unfortunately it, it has the potential to have wide implications. Um, the best thing we can do at this time is to provide, you know, to do everything that we can do for our patients and for our learners. I mean, I know that that I have a commitment, my colleagues have a commitment here at Emory to do that. That's why we're here. That's why we remain in Georgia. Um, and, and we will continue to do that. And we will continue to be here for our patients, be here for our learners to document the adverse impacts and uh, and work um, work so that we can you know achieve um, reproductive equity and justice again. And, and I just want to add one thing: as somebody who's practicing in New York, I, you know, I was watching Dr. Sweeck's presentation, and as an Emory alumni and as a graduate, and having family that still lives in 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 Atlanta, I just am so amazed and so proud at I mean how much they are stepping up to the plate and really finding a way to help their patients and navigate education and training. I'm proud to be an Emory alumni and um, I'm just amazed at how great, I mean, they are really just working in an atmosphere, you know, that could be difficult, but finding a way. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And uh, we are officially at an hour, but we did just get one final note that um, did want to shout out, but uh, we have a, a guest who shared <laughs> um, a shout out to Dr. Robert Hatcher. Uh, his uh, course in Rollins um, was uh, technology of fertility control, and it was an absolute highlight of their graduate schooling. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, fantastic. Well, with that, uh, we will go ahead and conclude today's session. And um, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Carrie Swiak, Dr. Adam Jacobs, and Dr. Rachel Neal for being here today and sharing their expertise with us. Um, we will share a recording of today's session after um, afterwards. So if you have anything else that you wanna go back and rewatch, you're welcome to. 
Um, and also I will share information on how you can stay connected with today's speakers, uh, as well as how you can continue supporting the work that they are doing. Um, so thank you again for joining us and thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.